Stay hungry, stay foolish. I've just finished recording our latest episode with somebody I've been dying to get on the show for a very long time, Dan Millman. And today we're talking about his latest book, Peaceful Heart, Warrior Spirit. And he gave me such beautiful language for what we do here with the show. What we attempt to do is bring new information from sources that you may not have heard that will ultimately affect your life in some way for the positive. So that is one of the drivers behind what we do on this show. Before we launch into that fantastic episode, I want to thank our sponsor Zai because because of their sponsorship, I'm going to move into a different studio where I can bring you more content on a more regular basis and bite more bite sized content as well for people who have got great feedback. And thank you for those people who have fed back to the show through our newsletter to tell me that these serialized shows are very effective and are useful for people. So thank you for that. So you will get more of those as well. But before we launch into any of that, I want to thank Zai. Zai is our sponsor. Zai is boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded finance products, empowering businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com. Let's get into today's episode. Our guest today tells us this story is mine, but the way belongs to all of us. His books and teachings have been a guiding light to millions of people, including myself. Now comes the true story of his search for the good life, a quest for meaning in the modern world. In vivid detail, he describes his evolution from childhood dreamer to world class athlete, including the events that led him to write the spiritual classic way of the peaceful warrior. Over the course of two decades, he was guided by four radically different mentors, the professor, a scientist mystic, the guru, a charismatic spiritual master, the warrior priest, a rescuer of lost souls, and finally the sage, a servant of reality. Each of them generated mind expanding experiences for our guest that prepared him for his calling as a down to earth spiritual teacher. It gives me great pleasure to welcome someone I have learned so much from and pass those learnings on to my children to magnificent success. It's a great pleasure to welcome the author of Peaceful Heart, Warrior Spirit, Dan Millman. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Aiden. Good to be here with you. It's absolutely fantastic to have you on the show, Dan. And before we even get into the content of this book or into the some of the topics I wanted to talk to you about today, I wanted to just highlight the impact that your children's books have had on my children. So Quest for the Crystal Castle is a book that Dan wrote, and it had a dramatic effect on my children about the idea of kindness begetting kindness. And Dan, I wanted to share with this with you on live on the show was that one of my sons is mad about what well, he was when he was younger mad about Batman. And when I read him that book, he said to me afterwards, he got he goes, Well, kindness begets kindness is kind of like a bat's echolocation. They send out a signal, and they get that signal back. And I was like, oh, beautiful, Dan Millman, thank you so much. But perhaps you'll share something on that, because that was just such a magical gift to give a child at such a young age. Well, one point in my career, my publisher, who uh, Linda Kramer, was a children's book editor in New York before she moved to California, married my publisher and so on. Linda said, Dan, what if we start, a, 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 I want to start a line of children's books. Um, and I wonder if you could write a book for children on the, along the peaceful warrior theme, but of course, scaled down. And it seemed interesting to me because I had children of that target age between like four and, and 10 um, for illustrated children's books. So I wanted to do something that had a message in it. That's all I knew. But I understood children like they grasp life intuitively in a, in a simpler way. So I couldn't have any abstract ideas. It had to really appeal to them. So I first wrote a book called Secret of the Peaceful Warrior about a little boy learning to deal with fear, which is a common thing in the form of a bully. What is he going to do? Is he going to run? Is he going to fight? 
or is he going to learn the secret of the peaceful warrior? And that was the theme of that book. I'm not even sure how I came up with the ideas in the book, but it, it worked out. And a, a quick note, because I'm not pr primarily a children's book author. These were two books out of 18. Um, but then later, I had the idea for Quest for the Crystal Castle, certain themes like the grass always seems greener on the other side of the valley, let's say, or the fence, and, and also the idea of kindness, beginning kindness. So I want to convey some uh, some substance for children in a way they could grasp. And um, I feel very good about both books. I, I, I've written a graphic novel. Uh, I wanted to try that, a screenplay I worked on for a while. But most of my books are either novels or nonfiction, as you know, um, books in the personal development area. So uh, again, I, I remarked to you off air that I just read Quest for the Crystal Castle to my grandson, Isaac, who's six, and, and he, he, you know, I think he's starting to absorb it uh, at this point. So yeah, it feels very good to reach out to children, adults, men, women, all, everyone really, um, because I don't, I don't speak to male or female or a particular age group. I speak to human beings and what we all have in common. You're a collector of quotes, and I mentioned this to you off air, and you say something that is so true of any teacher, because you will never know how you've impacted the lives of so many when you do this writing. And you quote Henry Adams at the start of this book, and you say, teachers affect eternity. They can never tell where their influence stops. So this, let's see how it plays out for Isaac, for your grandson, and also for my children as well. But it absolutely had an impact on them. So thank you for so that. Glad. Very welcome. Again, just before the book, I'm because there's so much content, you mentioned 18 books, also a movie is starring Nick Nolte as well, that Dan might mention later on, which is also available still today. So I highly recommend that. But I wanted to talk about something which is one of your many talks that are online. This is a TED talk. And I thought it was particularly relevant for our, our audience, Dan, because it's a, essentially about embracing change in the world of change, a, a rapid change. And I thought very much about a quote that I love, which is comes from Leo Tolstoy. And he said, everybody thinks of changing the world, but nobody thinks of changing him or herself. And I thought that absolutely spoke to the message that you were conveying there that one of the best ways to have an impact in the world is to first find peace with yourself and actually work on yourself. So I thought that'd be a lovely way to set a foundation for today's show. Well, that's a beautiful place to start. Um, there was a particular moment in time, maybe in our own lives, but also in history, when people realized they were frustrated in the 60s, the time of high idealism and so on. And they realized they couldn't necessarily change the world, the politics and the larger arena of industry and, and the environment, but they could change themselves. They, they, they had control over that. Um, and so people started working on their psyches, on their inner lives. Um, and we grew up in a, most of us today have grown up in a psychologically oriented culture where we assume we have to have the right thoughts, positive thoughts or a quiet mind, or we have to have the right emotions of kindness, gratitude, love, peace, happiness. And if we all have those right emotions and right thoughts, then uh, we'll live wisely and well. But as you know, the fourth mentor who brought me back to earth of the four I discuss in Peaceful Heart, Warrior Spirit, um, he pointed out that we have less control by our will over what emotions pass through us, like the weather, always changing. And we have less control over what thoughts appear in our awareness. He said, thoughts happen to us. We don't say, I think I'll think this thought next. Random thoughts just appear, sometimes positive, sometimes less pleasant or negative. Um, but we can't really, we don't have a spam filter in our head. So we can't necessarily control what we're thinking at any given moment, um, we can concentrate, we can solve math problems and remember grocery lists and create and do all sorts of things. But the random discursive mind, it's been called the monkey mind, um, it, it, thoughts just pop up. And so it, the sage, that fourth mentor gave me a new approach um, and it's a foundational approach that I teach today that our lives, if we look back on our lives, what we've accomplished, where we are now, it's largely due to, it's been shaped by what we've done from moment to moment. Our actions, not necessarily what we felt or thought. Now, I know people say, yes, but everything begins with a seed and thought, and then it becomes an emotion and motivates you and so on. That's one theory. It's very interesting. 
Um, but it still comes down to whatever we happen to be thinking or feeling at any given moment, what needs to be done in this moment. And so um, that's one way I simplify my life. A writer named Barbara Rasp once said, the lesson is simple. The student is complicated. And, and that's us. Um, so we complicate everything. And if we focus on what is my purpose in this moment and then do what needs to be done, whatever we're feeling, whether we're feeling doubt or confidence, we can still do it. Um, so that that is a radically different, it's a liberated way to live, a liberation from the tyranny of ever-changing thoughts and emotions. One of the things you mentioned there was in your first childhood book, the book you wrote for children, was The Bully. And The Bully is often prevalent in a lot of children's lives. And it was absolutely prevalent in your life as well. And as people will realize, our audience today, as we progress through the show, the four mentors that you had each added almost like a different lens. And through those lenses, you created your own unique experience of seeing the world, your own worldview, and, and ultimately, your own practice. But equally, if I was to put into a mixing bowl, all those things that happened to you as a child, the trampoline, the serendipitous trampoline, the, the crash, the bullies that you experienced, they all prepared you for this future. And it reminded me again of a beautiful quote by C.S. Lewis, hardships often prepare ordinary people for extraordinary destinies. And I thought about that when I read about your foundational moments in life, the dance class, for example, as well, and that how that molded together in the mixing bowl mixed with the trampoline and the experiences, perhaps you'll take us through these foundational years. Well, looking back, it all seems like destiny. Um, but I, I do believe I've come to the, the, the view that daily life is a form of spiritual weight training. If you don't lift any weights, you don't get any stronger. So we don't have to pretend uh, or seek adversity. It, it comes to us in everyday life. Life can be difficult at times, sometimes minor difficulties, sometimes major ones. So those events of my life, yeah, they seem quite serendipitous. Uh, um, a, a chance phone call, um, uh, all these apparent coincidences seem to shape our lives. When we look back, it's quite interesting how many times we had a decision to make and something influenced us. And so it did uh, end up all the sum of my experiences into an approach to living I call the peaceful warrior's way. Now, people who don't know my work might wonder, what is this? Is it some kind of a brand that I came up with? So let me start by saying where I came up with this term, as I explain in the book, I was teaching uh, at Oberlin College. I was an assistant professor in the physical education department at Oberlin. And, and my background, because of the bullies, as a young man, I was smaller in stature. I was the youngest kid in my class. And I probably talked too much, uh, a lifelong habit, apparently, um, which uh, attracted some bullies. And so I had to deal with that and the, the fear and the threats and so on. And so it led to an interest in the martial arts. So the term warrior came organically from my background studying various uh, martial arts, which have their own lineage and history. Um, and um, so it, it led to the idea that, that um, well, I was teaching this course, getting back to that, and I was in the martial arts. It was Aikido and Tai Chi. And so I was going to call it for the school catalog, uh, the way of the warrior, which makes sense, but it didn't quite fit because um, my, uh, these are internal arts, they're receptive arts. There's no aggression in Aikido. It's all responding to what comes at us. And Tai Chi also has this receptive quality. Um, so then a light bulb went on and I said, hey, why don't I call it the way of the peaceful warrior? So the idea of peaceful was meant to modify a warrior because most of us think of warriors as soldiers, fighters, police, armed people who fight. And that's true of the warrior. It has been through, through history. And there've been many warriors who were grounded, strong, brave, but they, not many of them had a peaceful heart. And there've also been many peacemakers who were kind, nourishing, supportive, we see them coming out of yoga classes, wearing white, you know, they're very pure and nice and sweet. Uh, they used to be called sensitive new age guys, that sort of thing. And, uh, but not all of them have a warrior spirit. So 
the term peaceful warrior is really about all of us. I view everyone as a peaceful warrior in training, everyone, because we're all seeking to live with a peaceful heart, uh, a sense of serenity and equanimity uh, amidst the changes and chaos of everyday life. Uh, but there are also times we need a warrior's spirit that can appreciate the benefits, the gifts of adversity uh, in terms of strengthening our spirits. If we look back, anybody looks back on the times they've had difficulties, challenges, adversity in their lives, they will probably agree that they're a little bit stronger now, maybe a little bit wiser in terms of sense of perspective, having gone through that. And it brought us to where we are now. And so, again, if there's no adversity, nothing to push against, uh, uh, there's no development. So that's, that's where the term, the phrase, the energy of the idea of the peaceful warrior's approach to everyday life came from uh, for those who are being introduced to my work. Beautiful. And you inspired me, Dan, I didn't share with you, I have a practice of wearing a pin that I, I feel reflects the show. And you might not be able to see this one, but it says, storms don't last forever. And what I read in your book, I read this, I went, this is the perfect pin for this, this episode, because one of the things you talked about there, you talked about leaning into the adversity, because it's absolutely part of life, you cannot avo avoid it. And I remember I'm, I'm a fan of Alan Watts work, for example, and he used to say, we need a snake in the garden, <laughs> we need that to have a contrast against which to compare our successes and our happy moments. And I, I share that to say, you are so open in this book, and you open the kimono, showing all the warts and all all the scars tissue that you've experienced literally and mentally from throughout your life, because although you had that huge success at a young age, it came through many adversities through bullying, etc. But when despite that afterwards, and I didn't realize this, and I said, I admitted this to you that I had no idea about the adversities you'd overcome through books and through failures. And indeed, through your studies, even in college, you had to work really hard and apply the discipline that you had with your exercise and your physical training into your mental training. Stepping back for a moment, uh, Ram Das used to remind us, you know, the Buddha said that life is suffering. But that was translated from ancient Pali, the language. And I don't, I don't think life itself is suffering. I don't think the, uh, the crickets or, or, or the uh, antelopes, uh, I don't think animals suffer psychologically in the same way humans do. I think the Buddha was talking about psychological suffering or a sense of dissatisfaction. And as Ram Dass pointed out, he said that uh, when we don't get what we want, we suffer in the sense that we're dissatisfied. If we get what we really don't want, we also suffer, of course. And even if we get exactly what we want, we suffer because it leads to a sense of insecurity. Can, how can we hang on to it? See, the Buddha was talking about clinging or attachment to what is. And life has changed. Life comes at us in waves of change. We can neither uh, uh, predict nor control but we can learn to surf those waves and accept and flow with what happens like a good Aikidoist, like a good martial artist. The force comes at you, you step out of the way, get offline and make use of it. And, and that's really a life skill we weren't necessarily taught in school. And so that's one of the life skills that I share with people. Whereas once I was focused on talent for sports, I be, I, my mind eventually expanded in my interest into how do we create more talent for living? for the challenges of relationships, finances, physical uh, uh, issues. And that's why I speak to everyone who's a human being, because we all share this quest for meaning, purpose, connection. Speaking of Ram Das, you, you mentioned in the book as well that you had an LSD experience. And I, I share this because you see an equivalent in every aspect of life. I want to lose weight. What's the easiest way? Can I take a pill for that? We see it in innovation work, for example, staying on the theme of this show, many people want the instant fix for change management within an organization, there is no instant fix, it's a change of behaviors and habits, which creates new realities over time. And you mentioned a great quote by Ram Dass, he said that LSD might point the way, but the only sustained spiritual practice can lead to transcendence. Again, 
extremely important part of your work. Wow. Yes, and that was one uh, formative moment in my life. Um, I probably haven't used uh, uh, I, I, uh, psychedelics for uh, many, many years, though I'm a huge supporter of the uh, proper use uh, with the proper guide, uh, uh, a professional in that area, the proper set and setting in a respectful way. I've never been a supporter of casual drug use just to kind of get high. Um, and, and if someone does that, then bless you, that's, that's their way. But um, I want to emphasize that. Uh, but many elders like myself um, are coming out of the closet, so to speak, uh, and sharing that experience that was formative in terms of, uh, in my case, LSD, and really going through the whole process of ego death and uh, transcendence and feeling that mystical, ultimate mystical state of unity that other people experience with ayahuasca or psilocybin and so on. Um, with my, Joy and I just, my wife Joy and I just saw a wonderful documentary. It's, it's not new. It's called uh, Fantastic Fungi. And it's about mushrooms. And it expanded my mind about what they are really about. Um, and it ends with the idea of using mushrooms for, as an entheogen, which means a connection to spirit. It's only one way. But as you pointed out, as Ram Das said, only sustained spiritual practice. But what is that? You know, what is sustained spiritual practice? Do you have to go off to an ashram? Um, do you have to sit in the mountains? You know, a man came up to me once. It's a story I love to tell because it really has a point. He said, Dan, I just read Way of the Peaceful Warrior, in your first book, and I just loved it. Now I'm interested in spiritual practice. But how can I... Uh, I find the time. I've got a wife and three children and a full-time job. And he came to understand his full-time work, his wife, his children were his primary forms of spiritual practice here, now in daily life. They will demand more of us and develop us more than sitting in a cave meditating. I know because I've done both. Um, so that's where the arena of the peaceful warrior is here and now in everyday life and living well through that rather than looking for it somewhere else, whether it's even though you can get a good preview of coming attractions uh, with a certain psychedelics in the right setting, um, that's just a preview. And pretty soon it becomes a memory. Uh, but right now is what counts always right now. I'm developing my practice of mindfulness and being in the moment. And it takes work. I mean, that's the thing. This is it's hard work. And Blaise Pascal said, all men's worries and woes stem from not being able to sit quietly in a room. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that, that's it, isn't it? And that takes more work than actually being active. And I say that to t tee us up for the next part, because you were a coach of many, many people athletes, and you had great successes and not such great successes at the same time as we all do. But one of the reasons I share that is, I was one of the people you mentioned, you said some athletes would train extremely hard, like it was like a fight all the time, everything was a fight. And that manifest into injury, etc. And it was only recently done and I'm, I'm 45 now. I was recently, I trained still as much as I can, mainly for mobility now. But still, it took me till I was 45 until I had a hernia, only recently from lifting too heavily, <laughs> that I realized and looked in the mirror and went, what are you competing against here, Aiden? You don't need to be lifting massive weights here in a deadlift or squat anymore. What are you doing here? You just need to train your future self. So when that future self looks back and can thank you someday and go, listen, thanks for all that mobility training. So somewhere along the way, I'd lost the way. And you recognize this in the book as well, that this happens to many people. Well, yes, it does. Um, and the story I tell is I walk into the gym, I'm the, a coach, the gymnastics coach, at this point in time at Stanford University in California. And um, Brian, the team captain, is has arrived early and he's lying on the floor stretching, warming up. And he, at that moment, he was lying on his back with one leg, straight leg pulled toward his chest uh, for splits, working on splits. You need a lot of flexibility in gymnastics. But what drew my attention was he was muttering to himself, 
oh, this hurts so much. I hate this. And I turned to him and I said, Brian, who's doing it to you? And, and that's really how many of us live. Uh, especially athletes, we're used to pushing always to the edge, always to the edge of pain. And sometimes we continue those habits. Yeah, we may achieve a lot unless we get burnt out or injured. Um, but it's like realizing the first time you do a golf swing and you really don't have to try so hard to hit the ball. Just let the swing happen, you know, flow. Um, or when you go running and you realize you can actually just lope along easily and talk with someone. You don't have to be pushing all the time unless you're training for the Olympics or something. That's a different story. So uh, there are ways to live more gracefully and easefully. I, I tell the story also about when I was uh, an office worker, a peaceful warrior, my first book had come out and then gone out of print. I figured I'd had a brief career as a writer. Um, and before it was republished, and then the word of mouth carried it for through the decades. But during this time, I was uh, it was a Friday afternoon. My wife and daughters were coming to pick me up. I had one hour to, uh, left of work, and I was trying to get this work done to free my mind for the weekend. And I was I felt the stress building, uh, pressure, headache building. My breathing was shallow. But I was not really fully aware of it at the moment. I was trying to shuffle papers and fill out forms and call people. I needed to do that. And I looked out the window and I saw a cloud drifting across the sky. And I took a moment to look at that cloud. It wasn't racing the wind. And it, it just was flowing along. And I found myself taking a deep breath and relaxing and I got back to the paperwork and did it in a smooth, graceful way. I called the people I needed to. And I was wondering, what was all that drama for? And often we unconsciously do that instead of letting life kind of flow a little bit more. So that's, that was a valuable lesson that I learned from a cloud. You know, many of us hear that story when the student is ready, the teacher appears. We've all heard that. But many people misunderstand it. They think when they're deserving enough or have suffered enough or have prepared enough or been initiated, then some teacher like Socrates, my literary mentor, will, will appear in their lives and to kick, kick them up the path or guide them up the path. But I believe when the student is ready or really paying attention, call it mindfulness, if you will, um, then the teacher appears everywhere, even in a cloud, even in a tree bending with the wind has something to teach us. Uh, so it's about, often it's about paying attention uh, to the moment and without judgments. Uh, but if we have judgments, humans are great at judgments, you know, if we have them, that's fine too, just to be aware of it. And again, to be a little easier on ourselves. And there is one other point because people say, well, but how do you do that, Dan? Well, I was in the gym one day. This is the story I tell. I was in the gym and Socrates, is, he's got his arms crossed and he's watching me. And I'm flying around the high bar and I do a, a twisting double somersault, something like that. And I stick my landing, which is a good thing in gymnastics. And I go, yes, you know. And so um, then I figure that's a good place to stop for the evening. So I rip off my sweatshirt, throw it in my workout bag, and we're walking down the hallway afterward. And Socrates stops and turns to me and says, you know, Dan, that last move you did was really sloppy. And I said, what are you talking about, Socrates? It was the best dismount I did in a long time. And he said, oh, no, no, no. I'm not talking about the dismount. I'm talking about the way you took off your sweatshirt and put it in your bag. And he was reminding me that I was treating one moment as special letting go of the horizontal bar and flying through space. And I was treating another moment as ordinary, like it really didn't matter. And that's when, again, he reminded me there are no ordinary moments. Beautiful. But he went, he went beyond that. He said, Dan, I got this line into the Peace for Warrior movie, actually. Um, he said, Dan, the difference between us <laughs> is that uh, you practice gymnastics. He said, I practice everything. And I said, well, what do you mean you practice everything? He said, well, you do things. You do the laundry. You do your, your schoolwork. You do gymnastics. He said, but he said, when you practice something, 
You're committing to seeing if you can refine or improve it. How many of us practice signing our name? Most of us just do it to get it over with. How many of us practice walking? Can we do it more smoothly? Practice breathing. And there's some wonderful work today and some good books on breath work and its impact on everyday life and health. Um, so that's the point he made about practicing daily life. I forget a lot. I just do this and do that. We go on automatic. I still do. But with practice, anything can improve. And so my practice of daily life is here and now with you right now. Beautiful, Dan. And it, it rem I was going to go off in this way and that way, etc. I want to come back to something you mentioned the cloud. And there's this beautiful story you tell of your daughter, Sierra, and the bird. <laughs> I'll come back to that because it's important, I suppose, for our audience to understand who Socrates is as well, because they'll, without context, they won't, they'll think you're talking about the philosopher as appearing to you, <laughs> the Greek philosopher. But also, I wanted to mention as well, the ultimate challenge that came to your athletic career as well, because this came again from a moment that Socrates would have said, Are you sure you want a motorbike, Dan? Right. And that's what my parents said as well. At the time, I was about 20 years old. And I thought it would be cool. I'd seen the movie The Great Escape and Steve McQueen looked so cool on his motorcycle. And, and, and cool was a, a major factor and value in my life at the time. Um, and there were practical elements too. It was economical you know, to ride and easy to park and so on and so forth. In any case, I did buy a motorcycle and ended up um, shattering my right leg in about 30 or 40 pieces. Uh, quite disappointing. I was at the peak of my career. I'd been training for 10 years toward the Olympics. Um, and now I had a shattered leg and, and it was uh, going to disrupt my life significantly. And, and it did. And, and the pain and so on was obviously part of that. Um, but it also shook me up. I started asking bigger questions about life. I realized I was no longer bulletproof, as many people in their 20s feel like they are. Um, and I started getting more reflective about life. So that, uh, that incident, uh, which I ended up uh, recovering from through hard work over time and uh, went back to help lead my team to a national uh, championship, um, that was quite exciting. And, and it was a, a very fulfilling kind of uh, moment in my life. But we all have stories. We all have adversities. That's the point. That's why I say the way belongs to all of us. The particulars of my memoir, um, I, I didn't write it with the assumption that legions of people just want to read about Dan Millman, this Dan Millman character. However, it's more about the spiritual search, the search for happiness, for the good life, for meaning and purpose. And that is something we all share in our own way. Um, and the four mentors were mine, but there are, we've all had teachers. Um, who we remember from school, maybe one or two or three, who demanded our best, who inspired us or saw something in us. Um, and we've had role models. But these four major mentors represent different aspects of the spiritual search, from the technical aspect, doing enough exercises and spiritual practices. And I did the creme de la creme of training, starting with 40 days, 10 hours a day, and advanced trainings after that with a professor. And then the guru, of course, had an entirely different approach. He said, I'd rather beat you with a stick than tell you to meditate your way to enlightenment. So he had a radically different approach. It was all about just the transmission of the divine source through his body, through his person, because he was transparent to it. Um, and he definitely had the mojo, I'll tell you. Uh, um, so it was really, I spent almost eight years with him. Um, and the way of life that he taught, living in a household, a community household, spiritual people in the community and studying his work, which was brilliant. Um, but then like many other teachers, uh, he was corrupted by the adulation of his devotees. Um, as one of my friends put it, he was a true spiritual master who would have benefited from going through a 12-step program. <laughs> <laughs> That's the paradox of teachers, because one of the themes of the book, as you know, having just read it, is that every teacher, including myself, is human, and every human has flaws. We mustn't put people up on pedestals and project ultimate wisdom and knowledge as if they can't make a mistake. And people tend to do that. 
Before we go in and maybe deep dive a little bit, dip our toe into each of the mentors and those amazing experiences you had, I thought it was interesting that what emerged for me was you mentioned the four, but there was all, always the one and it reminded me of the poem Footsteps, because Socrates was there in the background all the time. And I thought it was important for our audience to know who that is. And I hope I'm not spoiling the story here, because the grand reveal is that that you were indeed Socrates, and it was this inner self that was always supporting yourself. Well, yes, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, you know, some of us have heard about these metaphysical trainings where someone channels uh, some discarded entity. Uh, it was very popular back. There was somebody named Jay Z Knight who channeled somebody called Ramtha, and there were many different uh, well-known channels. Uh, some brilliant books by a woman named Jane Roberts, uh, Seth, Seth yeah, material. Yeah. yeah, Seth Speaks and the Nature of Personal Reality. So, and, and there's a beautiful book that Ram Das wrote the foreword to called Emmanuel's Book, uh, a lovely book. Uh, it's, it's like the uh, prophet, Khalil Gibran's the, the Prophet. It's beautiful. Um, and these are all they claim were channeled from some other entity speaking through them. And of course, there's a certain woo-woo, you know, fascination factor. Oh, they're channeling a discarnate 20,000-year-old uh, entity um, from another dimension. Uh, and, and that gets our attention. But in, in a way, writers throughout history have talked about their muse. And uh, we've all had the experience doing creative writing where we go, where did that come from? And so... Uh, yes, you could say that that I'm Socrates, uh, and that's what I basically uh, reveal in the preface to the new book, um, which may shock some of my readers. Um, but he is based, the character is based on a real old man I met in a service station, an old Texaco station uh, in Berkeley, California, in around 1966. After, actually, after I had shattered my leg, I was on a cane at the time. And um, he reminded me of the ancient Greek sage, this cosmic old gas station mechanic. Um, so I started calling him Socrates. So he's based on a real character that I remembered years later when it was time to write the book. And it seemed like a good way to convey the information. I mean, um, uh, King Arthur had Merlin and, and Frodo had Gandalf and uh, Daniel San had Mr. Miyagi and the Karate Kid. So and of course, Carlos Castaneda, the famous uh, Castaneda, he, he had the Brujo Don Juan Matus. So this idea of the struggle, the creative struggle between uh, a rebellious adolescent student and uh, struggling to learn and resisting at times. And the teacher, the wise teacher, just worked. So uh, Because after working with the first of my two mentors, I wanted to find a way to convey the insights I'd had a result of all my, you know, it was about 10 years with, with the first two of the mentors. And so when I wrote Way of the Peaceful Warrior, I thought of this old gas station attendant. So in a way, he was essential uh, for me because he allowed me, having this cosmical guy who just appeared in this gas station, um, allowed me to express bigger ideas uh, in, in our creative struggle together and relationship than, I, than this just talking as myself, a young guy at the time, uh, I could have conveyed what I wanted to share with, with readers. And somehow it worked. I'm not that brilliant. I wasn't able to just strategize. I think I'll write you know, a, a best-selling book that will be published in over 20 languages. And I think I'll write <laughs> that because wouldn't we all like to do that? Uh, I just wrote it. And as I indicated earlier, it died. The book died. It didn't get into any stores because they didn't know where to shelve it. There was no internet at the time. Do I put it in fiction or nonfiction? Well, it was a little of both. So, uh, but then it came back and around and people seemed to respond to it. But, but Dan, there's a key thing that you did here, and, and this pervades all your decisions, is that you made a decision and you went, you made something happen. And I say that because so many people are paralyzed by too many choices or not enough choices, or they, they become victims or they have a victim mentality. You made things happen, particularly reviving that book, the experience you had with Hal, where he wanted to revive the book and bring it to life again. And your your remarkable deal that you struck up for the <laughs> for the advance on your author's advance. That was a game changer. And I think that's worth mentioning as well. 
Well, yes, uh, the book was out of print and I, I couldn't get any interest. It was a quote unquote failed hardback. And this, uh, a woman I knew, I took a training of some kind and, and she uh, liked the book a lot, the old out of print hardback and gave it to her friend, Hal Kramer, who was 70 years old. He was a retired publisher and he read the book and was so inspired by it. He said, I'm going back into publishing and I'm starting a new publishing house and I'm going to start with this book. And it took him two years to get the book chains, the major chains to take one copy in each store. Um, and But gradually, though, people started telling other people about it. And initially, the, the subtitle of the book was A Basically True Story. But again, the bookstores were not amused by that because they didn't know what to do with it. So, uh, so many people started writing me, even about the few thousand copies that initially got out there. They started saying, Dan, over and over, this book changed my life. This book changed my life. And so he decided to subtitle it, A Book That Changes Lives a provocative title, for sure. And I've asked people, what do you mean it changed your life? And I think what they're trying to convey is it expanded their perspectives about the higher possibilities, their possibilities, and their promise. Um, I built a bridge from the everyday suffering of life and the difficulties, uh, even, even the high achieving uh, difficulties like I had as a young athlete. Uh, still, I wasn't happy. I, I won a world championship. Uh, I was the national champion as well, you know, in gymnastics. And I was a coach at Stanford University, but I was still struggling with my relationship at the time, my early marriage to, to one woman. Uh, since then, Joy and I have been married uh, 46 years, love of my life. And uh, as you know, she weighs in. She also writes a few pages in the book. Um, you know, she read all nine drafts of this new book. Uh, and around the seventh draft, she said, Dan, I have a little different perspective. Maybe I should write something. And I went, that's a great idea, Joy. So she did. And people seem to have responded quite positively to her. It was great because, you know, our memories deceive us. We remember things the, the, sometimes the way that suits us. And it was nice to see Joy's perspective chiming in every so often. And also, I want to tip the hat to her for doing your books for such a long time as well. Not only did she read your books, she did your bookkeeping as well. So well done, Joy. Uh, <laughs> not an easy task. Um, so, so before we get into the mentors, I wanted to mention the amazing little story you, you mentioned, because there's a reason I, I'm asking this one, which is when your daughter Sierra mentioned the bird story, because I, I often find that you get these moments of insight from the mouths of babes, if you ask the question, but many of us treat them like children, instead of actually treat them like the budding butterfly that this caterpillar will become. And oftentimes, they tell it like it is, they see things differently. And there's value in that difference. And this was a remarkable story. I'd love to share that. Uh uh, yeah, and Sierra and I are very close. We've written one book together called The Creative Compass uh, uh, about writing in the case of writing or any creative endeavor. Uh, she's, she's, uh, I'm very proud of her, uh, as well as my other daughters. Um, so, you know, children are like puppies, but they're also like little Buddhas. Um, there is a saying in the mystical traditions that children are still uh, remember on some sense, not consciously, but they have impressions from past lives, let's say, uh, until they're about the, the veil drops around seven years old. So this is a bit of a mystery, this story. Um, when I was with the guru, um, we had his books in our bookcase, some lower shelves. And when Sierra was about two and a half years old, um, Joy was pregnant with her little sister, China. And we bought her a teddy bear showing how the baby came out and so on. And so she kind of got the idea that mommy had a baby in her tummy, you know, and it was going to come out and she'd have a little, a little sister. Um, and this is important for the story, of course, to understand this. And so Sierra, at the same time, used to pull out books from the bookcase and look at them, open the pages and look for pictures. And she would often pull out the guru, one of the guru's books, and she would open to a picture of him in samadhi, uh, it's a state of higher consciousness, gazing into space, kind of like this. And 
I said, uh, and, and one day she's looking at this. She said, looking bird. And I said, what's here? And she said, looking at bird. And that was, that was cute. That was her interpretation of what he was looking at, a uh, bird. I didn't get it, but I accepted that. Well, soon after that, uh, just before dinner, I said to her, Sierra, where were you when, before you were a little girl? And she said, I was baby. And I said, well, where were you before you were a baby? And she said, uh, in mama's tummy. And just for the heck of it, I said, where were you before you were in mama's tummy? And she said, looking at bird. And that was like, whoa, how did she, the, the, this master's gaze in a higher state of consciousness, how did she connect that to where she was before she was in her mother's womb? Um, and then, of course, Joy reminded me that, that the icing on the cake, the end of the story was she remembered that when she was in labor with Sierra, doing Lama's breathing and so on, it was pretty intense. She was staring at a, 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 like a tissue box and painted on the side of the box was a picture of a bird. Beautiful. Looking at bird. So it's one of those mystery stories of life that I, I love to share. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. Let's give a whistle stop tour of the various mentors. I'll tee you up down with a quote here because you say in the book, the Indian saint Ramakrishna described the difficulty of trying to open a walnut shell when it was green, but noted how once it was open, once it was ripe, it would open with just a tap. All the skills you say that you'd practiced in your youth, all your experiences were part of your ripening process. The first three decades of your life prepared you for all that would follow. Now you are ready to throw yourself into any pro promising possibility. Over the next two decades, you would meet four radically different mentors who would each offer an initiation for the work that would be to come. They were all the lenses I mentioned at the start that ultimately came to offer you your own peaceful warrior way. So perhaps you'll give us a, a tour at a high level of the four mentors. Well, I'll try to summarize it as best I can. I said a few things about the professor and the guru uh, first, uh, and their significance to most people, not just to me, but to, to all of us. Um, well, first of all, one of the basic tenets of this approach to living that I teach is that there is no best teacher, no best book, no best philosophy or religion or diet or system of exercise or martial art. There is just the best for each of us at a given time of our life. So life is an experiment. We have to find out what works best for us. So I'm not claiming my mentors, my four mentors were the best uh, in history. There are hundreds, if not thousands of different teachers, influences, and so on. Um, but they were the best for me at that time in my life and could be instructive to others. So they were real people. This book is entirely true, as, as best I could express it. Uh, some of my other books blend fact and fiction. Um, so the professor was named Oscar Ichazo. I go into his background, very unusual background, quite unusual in the history of spiritual teaching, who gathered, was able to gather together a global heritage, not just Hindu or Zen or uh, Sufi, you know, but a global heritage of different traditions and the exercises practiced in these uh, in order to grow and to awaken uh, toward enlightenment. And he, he experimented with a group of 50 Americans from Esalen Institute in California uh, in, the, in the early 60s. Uh, they spent nine months with him down in a, a school called, a place called Arica, Chile, but at the border of the Atacama Desert in Chile, he was at the Institute of Psychology. And um, he worked with these people experimenting what combination of exercises uh, in different forms work best. And finally, he was ready to present 40-day trainings. So I ended up, through various circumstances I explained, um, ended up doing that training. What it represents is the technological approach. And many of us have been exposed to either EST or the Forum or LifeSpring or NLP or all kinds of avatar, you know, working with belief systems, methods 
of personal development, spiritual growth. And this was sort of a compendium of, of some really um, it's very highly respected among spiritual practitioners, this Arika training. Uh, by coincidence, it's the word America without the me in it. <laughs> uh, how appropriate. Um, but from there, um, I, I again, without going into too much depth, I, I, I ended up moving on for reasons I explained in the book to finding another coincidence. Somebody just mentioned a book and I discovered the guru. And I went through a process before I even joined up. And the guru, uh, his community could look to many like a cult. And we've all heard the word cult. But as the guru pointed out, he said, you know, this isn't a cult because it's very uh, difficult to get into and very easy to get out of. <laughs> he had a way of summarizing things that was quite brilliant. Um, and that was true uh, in a sense. Um, physically, nobody, you know, just you say, I'm leaving, bye. And that was it. Um, there was no manipulation or trying to keep you connected. And I go into the, the butt because I call it the steel thread. Uh, that it's difficult to break um, in terms of one's attachment to a teacher you believe or once believed is the ultimate choice for you, the, the way to illumination and, and uh, saving grace. Um, but I ended up again moving on. Uh, and, and there were some wonderful things I learned in the eight years practicing in this community. I wanted to tie it to a show we did recently. Uh, you may know Elliot Aronson, who a wonderful teacher, and we had Elliot on the show recently. And he's now 91, amazing man. And he he was telling us about that tactic where you make it very, very difficult to enter a group. And then people actually think more of the group. And then it's very difficult. To, so it, it, it that resonated with me, but also so serendipitously, as in the other day with the Oscars, the event and the quote that Denzel Washington said to Will Smith is that it's when you're at the top that the devil comes for you. That sprung to mind because the guru had developed this great group of people brought them together, his initial instincts and his initial teachings were pure, but ultimately the power intoxicated them. And this is something we see, bringing it back to the show and the innovation show, we see this with organizations, leaders get into positions of power, they be make riskier and riskier moves. Sometimes they bet the farm on the wrong thing. Sometimes they take advantage of people within their employee, etc. And the same thing happened here with the guru, unfortunately, and it happens time and time again, it seems to be a rite of passage of when you get to the top, some challenges thrown at you and to see almost like a test, like you say, until you pass the test, then you can move on to the next level. Yes, exactly. Um, and, and he once said, there are three reasons you'll leave. The guru isn't good enough. The teaching isn't good enough. The community isn't good enough. Uh, or you may even say you're not good enough. Um, but he never really opened the idea you may leave because it's the right thing for you to do at the time. And so the, that community was not a place to learn self-trust. And that's why it was such a blessing that I discovered the warrior priest. He described himself as a cheerleader to the soul which I've also used uh, in my own work. Uh, I would describe myself that way too. And, and he also uh, uh, reminded me, and I, as I remind others, I'm not here for you to trust me. I'm here to help you trust yourself. And so with him, I learned to step forward and stand up tall inside of myself again. And he gave me practical tools and a style. I modeled his style because he was so dramatic and adventurous. Um, I learned, you know, a, a, a powerful method of spiritual development and insight work through knife fighting. He was also a martial arts teacher, um, and so, and, and a metaphysician for sure, um, uh, clairvoyant, and so on. Um, so, working with him was a fascinating time. It was relatively brief, a year or two, um, but he really gave me the tools. Uh, to write uh, one of my best-selling books called The Life You Were Born to Live, which is a, a, a system of self-understanding and self-compassion for having for, for oneself and others to really a leap, a quantum leap in uh, self-knowledge. Um, like many tools, oracles, I Ching, Tarot, astrology, but this method is uncannily accurate for those who've read The Life You Were Born to Live. There's also an app uh, one can go to lifepurposeapp.com and uh, access all that information 
about their life path. And there are 45 different life paths and so on and so forth. So I learned that from him, but also the knife fighting training I taught for, for 14 years. People came from all over the world to do it. So it was very practical. It was really when I stepped forward and began teaching the kind of work I do now after the warrior priest's influence. I'm grateful to all my teachers. And they all had flaws, as I do, uh, as we all do. The sage was very different. Um, he was much more humble and modest in his promises, his approach. Um, he got his PhD in anthropological psychology. Um, uh, and one of his fellow graduate students was named Carlos Castaneda at UCLA. Um, so they, they worked together. They knew each other. Um, it was quite a time and a place. Um, and, and he had this realistic approach to life that I opened with in the beginning of, of our conversation together. Um, basically, uh, one of his teachers, Shoma Morita, a Japanese psychiatrist, um, advised people to do three things to live wisely and well. First, accept your thoughts and feelings, whatever they are, positive or negative, as natural to you in the moment, as you would accept them in meditation. Notice them, watch them pass. Um, and the second thing is, know your purpose. What is your purpose? How, are you living on purpose? Do you have a purpose? Of course you do. Um, in this moment. Um, so focus on your purpose. And then three is do what needs to be done in line with your purpose. Uh, whether, whether you're motivated or not, whether you're feeling confident or full of doubt, do move in line with your purpose. That's why I recommend to people dream big, but start small and then connect the dots. So I don't parrot the words of my teachers. I do some things that have stuck with me that really uh, fit uh, what I like to teach. But each teaching, each teacher has their own method, their own school, and it has to be done within that school. Within, So I created my own approach to living, which ended up being called the Peaceful Warrior's Way, based on these, these uh, experiences and, and mentors that I had. And it was a chance to reflect on my lineage and with appreciation to those teachers and acknowledge them. One of them is still living. The sage is still living in, in a little coastal town in Oregon, in the U.S. Um, and uh, we still we stay in touch, of course. And the others have passed into memory. Um, so it's it's been quite a ride. And, and I believe I found them because of my commitment to share whatever I learned with other people. I, I, I have an outpouring of generosity in that sense of loving to share what I've learned just like we might see a movie that we want to tell other people about. And so I remain enthusiastic at 76 years old. Now I have more to look back on and look forward to, but I wanted to write this memoir while I still had my um, mental faculty. Oh man, you're, you're going to have them for a long time. The, the body helps the mind and you're certainly still working the body very well. And you know that what you said there, resonates so strongly, Dan, I'm the same with the these books you see behind me, and your books as well. I was so happy to get you because I was like, I gotta share this gotta get this out. <laughs> Let our audience hear this as much as possible. Because helping somebody or inspiring somebody in some way is just a, such a beautiful gift to be able to offer to somebody and it's absolutely drives me. But one thing you said there was just, it's something that I see I, I do executive coaching, Dan, I, and I, I ask my coaches to first focus on a to be list rather than a to do list because everybody's looking for that pill, like, you know, give me give me the quick fix. And you need to firstly know what you're looking for or have something to aim for. So you can start to spot feedback from the environment that you're making your way there. And that's something that I mean that you picked up these different variations and different ways of methodologies, etc. But ultimately, they mixed in your own head with your own experiences and your own way of seeing the world. And that's what's so unique about your work, but also the possibility for everybody else is that their own story is so unique to them. And if they can learn to articulate it and have the courage to articulate it, it's absolutely fantastic. But Dan, 
I wanted to finish. I have a final quote that I just wanted to finish. I know our time is up. But while I'm doing that, I'd like you to think about your final message for our audience of all types. I told you the, t- the audience that we have here, many people working in corporate jobs, some unhappy with that role, some frustrated because they're trying to drive change in the organization, but the change isn't happening, etc. And before I even go there, and before I ask you that question, where can people find you now? Where, you mentioned some of the websites there, but where is your ultimate source where they can find Dan Millman? One stop, I'd recommend um, peacefulwarrior.com. I have a, light, a free life purpose calculator right on the splash page, when, on the landing page. Um, and there's online courses, all my books and audio programs are listed. So that's probably the best way to stay in touch. And if someone want, has a question, they, they can reach me through the contact um, that it'll get to me and I'll, I'll respond to his questions as best I can. Um, and, and I'd also like to um, share a couple of quotes. Uh, Shoma Marita once said, when running up a hill, it's okay to give up, to quit as many times as you want, as long as your feet keep moving. And the other quote, uh, Andre Gide, uh, because each of us is a student and each of us is a teacher. We influence other people by our example. Uh, we, we are all teachers. And Andre Gide said, everything that needs to be said has already been said, but it needs to be said again because no one was really paying attention. <laughs> so we, we can each express it as I have in our own way and share with other people and teaching is a great way to learn at the same time. Beautiful. And Dan, I, I my quotes absolutely echo what you said there. So a couple of quotes I pulled and these are Dan Millman uh, quotes, no one attains the final step on a permanent basis. In reality, we move up and down the steps moment to moment. There is no best teacher, religion, book, path, diet or anything else, only the best for each of us at a given time of our life. And I thought that absolutely summed it up. I have one final question, Dan. You're an expensive consultant to do expensive consulting on a personal level. I have a dollar. What advice will you give me <laughs> for my dollar? As you know, very well, Aiden, that actually happened to me a young college student said I what can you tell me I'm a poor college student, I have a dollar. And I told him six words. Uh, it would take a weekend workshop to come explain all the ramifications and the riches of these six words, but they're a lifetime practice. And those six words are here and now. Breathe and relax. Author of 18 books and a magnificent teacher who's been through ups and downs and has opted to share with us all these brilliant teachings. Dan Millman, it was an absolute honor to have you on the show. Thank you very much. And I want to say, you know, you can't know what the impact you've had in terms of sharing other people's wisdom. You know, there's this saying, nobody's smarter than all of us, right? Um, and, and you've helped share whatever I have to share and so many other people with your, your listeners. And so those who have tuned into your frequency, let's say, um, you can't know the good that you've done either. Well, that's beautiful, man. And, and uh, I, I love that. And it absolutely drives me. It's an absolute honor to talk to great teachers from all over the world. And I really enjoyed our conversation. And thank you for your time. I appreciate it. What a fantastic episode with Dan Millman. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I know a little bit off the path of what we usually cover on the show, but I thought it was essential for everybody to make better decisions on a personal level as well. Start with yourself and then bring it to the organization as well. I want to thank our sponsor Zai as always Zai is boldly transforming financial services with a suite of embedded finance products and services powering businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. You can check out Zai on hellozai.com and I will see you next week.